Hey YouTubers, it's me, Dominique, and today is June 26, 2019. I am about to attend an event hosted by Women's Real Estate Network here in Arts District of Downtown Los Angeles on Opportunity Zones. Um, what they are, how, what the potential benefits are for investors, and much more information. So, let's go! love to share everything <laughs> about our personal lives, about what we learn, about what we know. And today we will have Anna Snyder. And she comes from San Francisco. She moved from San Francisco to be in Orange County and be in LA chapter today. So I really want I really want you to call me give her a very well welcome so she can share about herself and opportunities. all for being here. I was, flew down yesterday and I spoke in Orange County and it was really awesome. It was my first time speaking to pretty, I mean, yesterday was pretty much 100% women and I speak to a lot of, do a lot of webinars, I do a lot of podcasts and it's just like a different energy in the room. Sorry guys, but it really is. It's <laughs> such a different type of thing and um, I really am, am happy to be here with you and it's okay for you guys to be here too. Um, but more of this, right? Don't we all need more of this? Yes. So I love that you're all here. So we're gonna talk about opportunity zones. I feel like I should give a warning because last night when I was going through some of it, people were like, oh no. So I wanna tell you, there are some ups and there are some downs. There's things you're gonna really like and there's things you're gonna be like, you did just say that. Okay, so I'm just giving you fair warning. So the faces don't fall through um, like they did last night. So I'm going to give you guys uh, some information about me. Talk about obviously what is an opportunity zone. That would be the thing we'll talk about. And then we're also going to talk about how did this come about. So a lot of people don't really know where these things came up. It's all of a sudden they're, they're here. So we're going to talk about that. And specifically we're going to talk about the tax benefits. And you guys are going to hear the benefits a few times because the first time you hear it, it might just go over your head. So don't worry about it. We're going to talk about it a few times, and by the end, you'll be like, I got this, okay? We're also going to talk about what types of gains are eligible, specifically capital gains. So the money that you put into an opportunity zone must come from a capital gain in order for it to be eligible for the tax benefits. So let's just clear that up right away. And then there are specific time frames. We have very specific time frames for different types of OC investments. We'll talk about that. Um, we're going to look at OZ investment versus a non-OZ investment and talk, look at the money. So if you put your money in a non-OZ, a traditional portfolio versus OZ, we'll look at what the dollars really would mean. And then finally, we will have a fight between OZ versus 1031, which is a different form of, of, of avoiding paying capital gains tax, and we'll see who wins. So here we go. And then we'll have a review and questions. So here we go. First of all, there is an important disclaimer. It's a lot to read, so I'm just going to hit the highlights. We are not CPAs. I'm not a CPA. And this is a tax benefit webinar, and it's informational in nature. You must discuss the details with your CPA before you make investments in, in, in opportunity zones. It's really important. Um, all investments involve different degrees of risk. You should be aware of your risk tolerance level and financial situations at all times. You're free to accept or reject all investment recommendations made by us. All services that we offer are subject to market risk. May result in long-term investment. As you know, a recommendation is not a guarantee. You all know that real estate for the successful performance of an investment, and we cannot guarantee against losses arising from market conditions. Do not invest your money on our recommendation alone. Consult a professional advisor. Yay. Okay. So first, we're going to talk about what is an opportunity zone. And so it is a designated census tract. So that's the first thing to understand. It's not a zip code. It's a census tract that is a lower income area. It has lower than normal growth or income, okay, compared to the areas around it. And the government is offering tax incentives for people to bring in capital to improve those areas. That's the whole game plan. They want money to pour into these areas. They want these areas to improve as a result of it. 
So the census tracts were qualified by local and state governments. Okay, they were hand-picked. And then they were approved by the, the US Treasury. They all had to be then approved. Okay, so that's, people say, well, how do they get there? Um, and most states have their census tracts. If you basically Google, you know, you could Google California Opportunity Zones map, and there's a lot that will come up, or whatever state. You can even do your city. And it's pretty, it's, it's like, boom, there's so much technology out there to see. And then you just zoom in, and zoom in on your map, and usually it's green. For some reason, they pick that green color for almost all the maps. So really easy to find your, your area. And I think you're going to be surprised about what, are, what opportunity zones there are. So some of the qualifying things that they use is this 20% number. So in order to qualify as an opportunity zone, there needs to be a poverty rate of 20%. Plus, a plus or a median household income that was 80% or less compared to the census tracts around it. Um, and then there was this other number. We didn't have to speak to this one. So these are just some ideas of how they got picked. Okay? So the bottom line is that 57% of all neighborhoods in America were considered. And the result of that is over 8,700 opportunity zones were identified. That is a huge number across the United States. And what's even more interesting is that 19% of those that big, large number are already in gentrifying areas, okay? So these are areas where if you look at them, you'd be like, there is, this, is, this can't be an opportunity zone. Are you kidding me? Has anybody seen any of those? Driven through some where you realize it's an opportunity zone, you're like, that's not right. Somebody, somebody paid somebody, this should not be an opportunity zone, right? Um, interestingly enough, when they were designating the opportunity zones, it was they used the census. Does anyone know when the census, the last census was? 2010. What was happening in 2010? There was a very down market. So think about all of those areas that were experiencing a huge down. Uh, Phoenix was doing terrible. Las Vegas, okay? So these areas were in the dumper. So using that census trap, the governors were able to say, oh yeah, downtown Phoenix, it's an opportunity zone. Where it's like, the cap rate's like four in downtown Phoenix. Like how is it, how is it an opportunity zone? It's an opportunity zone because they were using the 2010 census. And that was not against the rules. So people played rules how they did. And, and that didn't happen everywhere. I want to say that some, some state governors really looked at the opportunity for the neighborhoods. And they were, you know, but different states handled it different ways. And I think that's why we've got kind of a variety in the end. Yes? Will they classify these opportunity zones in 2020 in the next Yeah, great question. So no, they will not be reclassified. These 8,700 plus are, are here to stay for, I think it's a 40 year window. Because some people will ask, if I buy into it, can they take it away? If I, if, I, if I go there and I commit, can they remove it? No, not for 40 years. Now there, there could be, they could, they could add more possibly, so it, it, that's not impossible, but just know that the ones that are currently there are not gonna be snagged out from under you. So this is just kind of a hero slide. Yep, 8,700. Okay, so we're just going to watch a quick little video here, and this is going to warm you up to get the, 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 the numbers. I think you should just click one more, Olivia. Just click. You don't need to click. Just go one more forward. You just go one more forward. There you go. And then turn it up really loud.
take a capital gain that you've already recognized within the last 180 days, invest it in an opportunity zone, real estate, a piece of real estate or a company, and you will defer the tax on the gain that you would have otherwise recognized until 2026. And if you hold it long enough, that gain gets reduced by 15%. And then you have the potential to eliminate the tax on the investment you make in the opportunity zone. So it's, it is a very powerful. And we're going to go through those numbers again. Yeah, this is just the first time you're hearing them. We're going to do it three times. Tax deferral at first, then a complete tax free, provided you hold the investment in the opportunity zone for a period of, I think it's something like 10 years, but you can correct me on that. Now, how do you do this? Do you have to set up a fund, or if I'm an individual and I want to do this, will there be funds uh, established that I can put my money in to, to take advantage of this? How's it going to work? Yes, so there already is a whole bunch of lawyers and accountants and bankers focused on this, and I think it's both. Uh, if you have the means and the sophistication, you certainly can make investments directly, but there is a lot of capital formation already in the works to pool people's money together and invest it in opportunity zones. So I think people have both options. And Mark, history is littered with disastrous outcomes born of the most well-intentioned things. I don't know how this is going to work out, but can you see some bad actors getting into this as well? Uh, yeah, the history insight is accurate, and anything that has good intentions, uh, and even sometimes good results, can have the opposite. And, uh, and hopefully, because this is potentially really powerful, I can't think of the anything else that has the power to transform these communities the way this does, if it works well. But of course, it does need to police, be police carefully. The rules need to be uh, made and enforced in a way so that it is positive and negative is uh, eliminated. So that's sort of the highlight of it. Yeah, going forward, there you go. So first we're going to talk about, we're going to get back into those numbers that he was talking about. But first I want to make sure you know where, how this came about. So does anyone remember this guy, Sean, Sean Parker of Napster? So he was actually behind this. So Sean Parker of Napster got together with Tim Scott and Corey Booker, and together they worked with the organization called nonprofit economic innovation group in DC to write the legislation. So it's a bipartisan thing that came together, which is kind of cool. So they helped map out and they um, to assign a distressed community index. And then this was all inserted in the tax code under the Tax Cut and Job Acts. And that came about in late 2017, right? But when it first came out as part of that big package, Nobody really noticed it because there was so much loop law about that particular, you know, job act. And uh, it took a few months for people to really realize what this thing was and pay attention to it. So now, in the past six or seven months, it's all you hear about, right? Opportunity zones, opportunity zones. But the problem is, as we'll talk about later, there's a lot of hype about it, but there's also a lot of potential issues with it. So let's talk about the tax benefits. We're going to go over the two things, the three things that, he, that the gentleman just said. So the first thing, the first advantage when you're bringing capital gains is in is that you can defer paying your capital gains for seven years if you brought it in this year. So say you have a million dollars that you sold, you sold stocks, and you have a million dollars of capital gains. Instead of paying the capital gains now, you can defer it for seven years, which is pretty nice, right? Sounds good to me. And there's no interest charge on that deferral. The other thing is, if it's a seven year time frame, you get a step down in basis where instead of paying 100% of your capital gains, you're going to pay 85% of the capital gains. So you get a discount. If you don't make the seven year time frame and you're investing in opportunity zones a couple years later, so you have a five year time frame, then instead of 15% off, you get 10% off. So it's still kind of nice, all right? After that five-year period, then you don't get anything off. All you get is the deferral. Now, here's the big thing, which is the next one. If you hold your investment for 10 years, then the money you make on that investment, so all of the appreciation of that particular asset, is tax-free. That's the big one. So if you... If you but not the original. Not the original one that you brought in. You still have to pay capital gains on that. I know, I know. But 
10 years of growth, so you have to keep it in for 10 years in a day, right? And so 10 years in a day, then if you sold it then, then that's tax free. What if you hold it for 20 years? Still tax free, the 20 years of growth, okay? It's a, like I said, it's like a 40 year window, which is a really nice long window to grow a lot of wealth. Uh, for a lot of families, and uh, this can be a huge game changer in, in wealth, but you do need to keep it in for that, that 10 years. And we'll look at in, in a little bit the difference between the investments. So first let's talk about what types of tax gains, gains are eligible. So both long and short-term capital gains, and I'll bet there's some people in this room that might do some activities that generate short-term capital gains. Anybody? Flippers, flippers in the house, yep. Short-term capital gains, you can put it into an opportunity zone instead of, and you'll see some of the differences between um, what you can make. Another thing is gains from business assets, so if you sold a business, then moving on. Also, if, you, if any sale of personal assets, so like a piece of artwork or um, an antique car, so any type of a capital gain from those types of things. And as you mentioned, gains from stocks. So there is a huge amount of money that's caught up in stocks right now that they're trying to release. The, the thought is, especially with stocks, that people don't want to sell because they don't want to pay the taxes. So this is a strategy to release a huge amount of capital gains and put it into communities to build those communities. That is like really what they're trying to do here. And then lastly, um, you can add gains for the sale of a property. If it's the sale of a property that's your personal house, you know, after you take the 121 exclusion, the amount of up and above that, or if it's the sale of a rental property, it's a different strategy compared to a 1031. Both of them are, are strategies you can use. You cannot use them together. It's either, either an OZ fund or 1031. So time frame, when you have that capital gain, when you have that, that sale of that thing, you have 180 days to get it into an OZ fund. Now I say the word fund, but it can be a single asset that you're buying. It's kind of a misnomer. Even if it's a single asset, they call it a fund, okay? So you buy, say you buy one on your own, you file one piece of paper with the IRS, I forget the, 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 the number of that piece of paper, and you are an OZ fund. And that's the first step to be OZ eligible. So you'll hear me use that word, but it doesn't necessarily always mean multiple properties, okay? That's just the correct terminology. So 180 days. And so how is this measured? It's measured differently by different gain types. So generally the 180 days begins on the date that you sold something, but you need to check with your CPA. Because, you know, so for publicly traded stocks, for example, it's clearly it's the date that you sell the stock. But for different types of things, such as a REIT, the undistributed capital gain is the last day of the REIT's taxable year that is the date that triggers the 180 days. So you really need to check with your CPA to understand what that 180 means, okay? And then we'll just go through this. There's a couple extra bullets on there. And then the OZ funds, if you were to invest in a fund that's not yourself, that fund has 31 months to put your money into an opportunity zone project. So some people are invest putting their money in a fund. They have to time it so they put their money, the, that money goes into a specific asset within 31 months. So those are, are two of the timelines involved. So if your gain is part of a partnership, this is kind of like one of those benefits. If you were selling a business, for example, as part of a partnership, then your partner doesn't necessarily have to go in with you. You can break it up, which can be a nice thing, because that's not always true when, when you're selling a business or a partnership. So the only types of things that the OZ fund can invest in are equity investments, and there's two main kinds. Real estate or businesses within an opportunity zone. So clearly the real estate has to be an opportunity zone too. So those are the two different types. So we'll go on to I think the next one might be the percentages. All right, so here's the thing. This is, this is the part where you guys are gonna get kind of sad, okay? <laughs> Just warning, okay. So in order to be eligible, in 
bought this property, let's just pretend it's you, you bought this property, you, you filed your form, you have to, to substantially improve the property. Well, what does that mean? It means that if you bought a pro the property for a million dollars, whatever the tax assessed word of, uh, amount that's land, say that's 400,000 and the building is assessed at 600,000, you have to bring in another 600 grand on top of that million to substantially improve it. Okay? So that's the part that people get pretty sad at. That's kind of the line that people miss about opportunity zones. They're like, I have to bring in how much money? How about for business if there is an underlying Sorry? How about for a business investment if there is no underlying land? This is actually about, um, it's a great question about business. Um, but I don't have the answer for that because my expertise is in real estate. We're value add, and, and we do some exterior work, and we renovate the interiors as, as we turn renters, and that's how we improve the building. That's one strategy. This won't work. This value add strategy is not compatible with opportunity zones because you can't bring enough money in. We say you can't put enough lipstick on that pig. It's too expensive, okay, because you're going to over-engineer that thing that you're doing. It's not even worth it. So for many, many of us, when we're looking at this, we're saying, this means new construction. This means you've got to build ground up, or this means you're buying maybe a house that has property in the back, and you are building a duplex behind it. Somehow you are substantially improving it, but you're doing a lot to it, okay? So this is the, the thing that really gets people. And you, Go ahead. Do you have a period of time where you need to? Yes. Ding, ding, ding. Good question. Do you have the improvements must be completed within 30 months? It's a great question because if you've got to be in it for 10 years, well, if I have $500,000, I've got to put it in over 10 years. Can I just do $50,000 a year? No, you cannot. You have to bring in, you have to complete your substantial improvements within 30 months. Do you have and to if you pay? Think about it, sorry, let me get you right. Okay. If you think about it, that's not a bad thing because what they're trying to do is substantially improve the area, not on your schedule, but on the schedule of the community, right? So if you think about the intention, intention of it, 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 it makes sense. Sorry, so does that money have to be yours personally or can you pool that from other investors? Very is that a loan or? It does not have to be yours personally. You can pool it from other people. Okay. And it does not have to be capital gains. Just the initial infusion, that the purchase, has to be capital gains. Your capital expenditure money that you bring in, my understanding is that it does not have to be capital gains. It could be money that, that's part of a loan, okay. right? So so it doesn't, it doesn't. So if you start getting creative with your financing, you know, first it's kind of like you got kicked in the gut, right? Once you found out this information, and then you start figuring out some creative financing and going, I might be able to make that work, right? So that's where you have to get to, is how to make it work. But it's a significant project you're taking on. It's not, a, it's not a value add, it's not a cosmetic flip. It's a big project. Okay, you can speak to the, these two slides is that they're repetitive. So um, in terms of, invest, the, the only thing I'm going to say about um, the business side of it is there are two rules on the real estate side of it. There's a 90% rule. So if you're an opportunity zone fund, 90% of the money in your fund has to go into opportunity zones. Then you can have 10% that's not in opportunity zones. For businesses, if you are a, a business, then 70% of the property needs to be in an opportunity zone, but 30% of the of your business locations can be outside of an opportunity zone. So those are just some interesting things to know if you're doing those types of things. But now we're going to look at a sample of, of what of the, the difference between OZ and non-OZ. We're going to start with, okay, hold right there. We're going to start with, uh, this is a, a, if you bought stocks, okay? So you took your money and you bought stocks with it. The first thing to notice, let's say this is using $100, so we're using $100 as our basis. So for every $100, this is the growth. Notice it takes five years to recoup your $100 because you had to pay capital gains and it took you five years to recoup that loss. 
and then this is the growth of your hundred dollars in ten years. So in ten years you got 132. So now we're going to layer on top the opportunity zone. You didn't have to pay the um, capital gains on the first one, so you had nine dollars. We go again. So you had deferral, right, of the first one. So you you had additional money on that. And then you had additional deferral um, there, and then at the end, and then one more click. So the, the, it's hard to read because it's on a cement wall, if you guys hadn't noticed. It's on a cement wall. <laughs> so you will get a copy of this as a PDF, okay? So what the bottom line is, is all else being equal, so say that the 10%, 10, you know, say it was 10% gains you were getting. All else, else being equal, for every $100 you invest, you will be $44 better off if you have put it into an opportunity zone fund versus stocks. So, pretty cool. And now we're, we'll look at it more from a real estate standpoint. Different people connect with different uh, ways of data, so I'm showing you one more way. So traditional investment, a million dollar investment, nice, what, nice round numbers. In the traditional investment uh, with the gray one, you had to pay your capital gains of 238. So your after-tax investment was 762. For the OZ investment, you had a million dollars and the million dollars went in. Okay, we good? Okay, you can go to the next two. And then after the 10 years, we have the year 10 after tax value on the gray side, on the traditional investment, 1.687. On the OZ side, because we have, we, we have all that money that stayed in there, 2 point, I'll call it 2.6. Can you pick one more time, please? But don't forget we had to pay our taxes. Right? We didn't pay 238, we, we paid less, so we paid 202, so we're going to take that out, we paid that along the road, and then finally, our final number is the total 10 year tax value, after tax value, again we have 1.687 on the left, and 2.391 on the right. So, pretty substantial difference. For those of you that want to read the bottom of the slide when you see it, that, that shows you the assumptions that are built into that. And then we'll give you a little graphical version of it. A little fun there. Oh, oops. Do that. There you go. So, so that's what we, the numbers we were just looking at. That is the difference between traditional investment versus opportunity zone. So it may be worth it, you guys, to figure out that financing because that is substantial, a substantial difference. That, that, is, that is creating wealth. And it's also investing in communities. Right? That didn't show the additional monies. No, not that line. The other one did. This is just showing the trajectory. But the, the previous one showed you. And you'll, when you look at the slides, the PDF, you'll see the line items where everything's subtracted. And then, you know, so it showed you paying taxes on the previous one. So now we're going to talk about some of the perils of opportunity zones. Now that you guys are all excited about them, we're going to talk about some of the potential issues, some of the potential downfalls of opportunity zones. So number one, we're going to discuss that we're, we're basically doing new construction here, right? We're, we're, we're most likely built to creating a class A building. If you're creating a class A building in a class C location, that could be an issue because the tenant quality of that area and it might be low, the future buyer interest in that area could be low. So how do we resolve this challenge. We have a couple of ideas. The first one is, remember that 19% of OZs are in already gentrifying areas. So putting a class A building in one of these locations will be less of a mismatch, right? Second, it's also possible to track. So say you're like, I know it's a C area, but this is my heart, this is where I grew up, I really want to invest here, or you know, something like that. You can track where the money's going. You can look at where the institutional money is putting their money. There's lots of websites out there, and if you're going where a lot of people are going, then it's a much better chance that that neighborhood is going to be uplifted. If you're the only one in there, you might be taking a higher risk that the neighborhood's not going to turn, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to turn neighborhoods, right? And then lastly, we like to look at the edges of opportunity zones. So what does that mean? So every opportunity zone, if you think of it as a census tract, like the palm of my hand, around the census tract are areas of, of higher, higher, higher median and income 
high, uh, house values that are larger, right? So they're trying to envelop this area into those surrounding areas. That's the objective, right? Well, if you're going to invest in this area, where's the best place to invest? Along the edges. If you, involve, if you go in the middle, then that middle may never get absorbed into the out. But if you're investing on the edges, there's a much greater chance that those are going to be become you know become part of the surrounding area. It's still going to be part of the same census tract, but in terms of the cap rate values and the value of that, the evaluation of that building and that block is much more likely to change. Okay, so yes. So on that edge, I've looked at opportunity zones that have been a little while. When you drill down in that green area, it'll show like. Because it's does. not usually a, a square, right? It's like it, all absolutely. kind of weird. So you can literally go, okay, this side of the street or that side yes. of the street. Okay. Yes. And then what we like to do is, so you drill in and you look at those edges, yeah. um, then we look at what's on the other side. Yeah. Because if you look on the other side and it's like barely any higher income, you're like, well, okay, well, that's not that, that you know, that's not that impressive to me. So we try and find a true mismatch where you've got like, you know, this side is very strong and this side is, you know, the, the OZ. Yeah. And then there's um, a much greater chance that it's going to be absorbed. One question. I'm assuming that all of your capital is locked into one investment, you wouldn't be able to take that out from one mm -hmm. period and be invested into another location or another. Um, so, so there's not. So the question is um, whether there is a whether your money is locked in. The money that you put in is completely locked into that location, and you can't take it out and put it someplace else. My understanding, and you've got to read the rules and talk to your CPA, is that you can refinance, just like any project. You don't want to refinance as soon as you put it in. You want some time, some time to evolve. But you can refinance, take the money because you've increased the value, right, substantially. So you can refinance, take that money out, and and go and move it to another project. Uh, not necessarily. You know, it doesn't have to be. I mean, that there's no limit on refinancing where you, what you do with that money or where you put it, right? Um, no, yeah, there wouldn't be any capital gains paid on refi as long as you separate it out long for far enough so they're not thinking you're just tricking them, right? Do you, like, what's your strategy because you're probably investing in areas that you don't always live in. So like here we can drive around that literal street and maybe intuitively decide. Are you just using Google Maps? Do you have people like real estate agents on the ground in other areas? We focus on data. So we literally look at data. We look at median household income. We look at poverty levels. We look at unemployment. We look at jobs. We look at population. And that is, that's how we treat all of our real estate. So we apply data science to real estate. And that's our normal mode of operating. And now we apply data science to, to opportunity zones. Now, we, have, we can't have the same standards because these are opportunity zones. So they're going to have lower median household income. So that's where we try to use strategies of edges and what's on the other side of the edge. But we're also looking at the overall, the larger metro and understanding that that is a metro that population is growing and jobs are growing. We never invest in a market that's losing population. Yeah. We just don't. We're using other people's money to buy large things. And so we have a, a higher threshold of responsibility. Right? And so we have data that, that supports, to the best of our ability, you know, here's what we're you know, projecting and here's why. Why we think this is a good place to invest. Okay. Yeah. Two um, I don't understand. Yes. I just, I have a quick question. Um, yes. So it was my understanding, and I may have gotten it a little bit confused here, but it was my understanding that it was only the capital gain that you had to keep invested. You could recoup your initial investment back. That is true. Okay. The, the capital gain. So if you say you sell a property and you have the, some principal and some capital gain, right. she is absolutely correct that you only it's only the capital gain you could so you can hold your principal someplace else. Unlike a 1031, which is one of our later things, but you got it, ding ding ding. That is correct, and that is one of the advantages of opportunity zones. And that's coming up on a future slide. This is a secondary question. Yeah, and it's just and this is just a follow up. So I've been following opportunity zones for about eighteen months. Uh -huh. And because you're right, it was tied into the twenty seventeen job act bill. Um, a lot of people didn't know about this. And I'm looking in Tennessee, which they have a tremendous amount of opportunity zones that have been designated. I've been following the maps for a long time. Um, I will say and they didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I will say what your comment about the edge is 
very true. But the thing that's tricky is finding CPAs and also because they didn't even know what to do with this. Right. You know, the government didn't, so that's why I was kind of delayed for a year until they figured it all out. But I would go talk to my real estate attorney and they're like, what are you talking about opportunity zones? So still, even in certain areas, there's a lot of people that are unfamiliar and I was like educating my attorney in Tennessee about right. it and then all of a sudden it exploded here in California. Yes. And this was like last fall. Right. And so, I've already been working on it for almost a year. So some states have done a much better job yeah. than others in embracing this opportunity and they created um, departments within different cities. There's a state organization, so you can actually call the city and say, I want to talk to your opportunity zone specialist. Mm -hmm. And you can ask them, where are the projects? I want to I, I want to invest in my city. Maybe you're looking to invest in opportunity zone. I want to invest in my city. Where, where are the projects in yeah. this city? So, you know, show me where the funds are. You know, that's one way. If you're, if you're really, if your heart is in a certain location, that is one thing you can do. More cities are coming on board, but um, I believe that um, Colorado and California and a few other states have done a really tremendous job. And there's a ton of technology and websites out there to, to give you information, but not all are doing um, that great. Did you have a question over here? Yes, it, what is the purpose in the minds of the legislators? Because it looks like all they what they're actually doing, whether they meant to or not, is uh, speeding up gentrification. Then it that so, produces more homelessness, it produces so the question is, is about how gentrification is going to impact um, these areas, how Opportunity Zones is going to create gentrification to, um, that may be in conflict with the community. I think that the people that we have in the White House are not concerned about gentrification as much, <laughs> and that they're more involved and concerned with um, growing you know, the, the capital side too. To, they're saying, you know, if you're going to change the community, you have to invest capital. Now, this is where I would say it's it's up to the people that love those communities to take care of how that opportunity zone is is blossomed. So, for those that are that are really really involved in their community, you you can have an impact. So, people can get involved and make sure that the, the money is being invested in businesses that they like, in um, the developments that are being made are, are you know, ones that they, they think are going to help people. I will say that there, unfortunately, there is not any, um, currently in the, in the law, there is nothing that ties back to ensure that it's actually helping the people of that community, which I think is a big miss on their part. How do you measure? Do you measure it just by median household income or do you measure it by the population and the people that are impacted? My understanding is there is no, there is nothing in the law that looks to the people and says, did this benefit you? So the measuring side of it is not there and I'm hoping that it comes in the next tranche of laws where people are held accountable for you know, the projects that they're doing and they're not just going into communities and Gentrifying them to the extent that everybody's nobody's they where they want to be. There. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But gentrification does happen. You know, it's it's a double-edged sword. But the government should push against it. Well, at the same time, I mean, there there is a good side to that: to capital being infused into that's communities. True. So so that's why I say it's a double-edged sword, um, and it's up to the people to to um, oversee how it's implemented something and moves on. Well, in this case, remember, they have to substantially improve it and they have to stay in it, okay? They can't just leave because then all the substantial improvements done and, and none of the investors or people whose money that's in there are gonna get their tax benefits. So, what we recommend is that you work with development teams that already have a track record of holding. This isn't their first rodeo. This is the way they normally operate. We build things we hold them. And we've got a whole team, we've got a whole department in our company that that's what they know how to do. They know how to asset manage, okay? So you want to make sure you're working with the right developer. It is less of an issue if you're in a strongly gentrifying area. So if you have an inexperienced developer at holding, if your tenant class is already like a better tenant class because it's a gentrifying area, then it's not as challenging as if you are in a, you know, a C-class area. That's a more challenging area to property and asset manage for a 10-year period. 
it may be a, law, a, a bumpier road. But if you're in an already gentrifying area, it's less bumpy, and so a developer with less experience holding might not be a bad, might, might not be such a mismatch. So third peril, a lot of developers have no skin in the game. They don't have any money left in the project. We believe that you should only, go ahead, we believe that you should only partner with developers that are going to invest a substantial amount of their own money. So if the project is not going well, they feel the pain as well. So everybody needs to be accountable. Construction projects can get stuck in zoning and entitling. So that can be an issue because remember we've got timing things going on. Remember we've got this, this 30 months. If you're doing a new construction project and it's going to take three years to zone it, well that's an issue. You've missed your time zone, right? So our solution is Whenever possible, only invest in projects that are shovel ready. If you're going for new construction, go for projects that are already entitled and already zoned. And if that's not possible, work with development teams that already own the land. So they're, they're already in, in that land. And then finally, look for projects where the city itself is involved and looking for these projects. Cities are getting very involved, like we said. So look for, for projects where the city is less And our final one, developers might only be working on the project because it happens to be in an opportunity zone. So you want to make sure you're not on one of those projects. These are projects where it was not good enough to be executed before. We call these zombie projects. But now it's in an opportunity zone and they're trying to, they're dredging up all these old projects and trying to shuffle them off on investors. But they were never good enough before. And now, because it's an opportunity zone, they're saying they're claiming it. So you want to find out if the development team owned the land or executed the project before the area was declared an OZ. Fight Club 1031 versus OZ, which one is better? And wrap it up. So with opportunity zones, you must reinvest capital gains only within 180 days of sale to qualify for capital to, to qualify for capital gains tax advantage. Okay? And then it's not you're not required to roll over the entire game. And then as you brought up, for 1031 exchanges, you must reinvest the principal and the capital gain within 180 days of sale. So we're going to give this round to opportunity zones. Okay? Next round. An investor may place opportunity fund investments directly. No intermediary is needed. With 1031 exchange, a qualified intermediary is required. You have to go through a QI, it costs about 800 bucks. We're going to give this one to Opportunity Zones. With Opportunity Zones, tax payment on capital gains, the initial, initial investment is deferred until uh, 2027. So that's a good thing. With 1031 exchanges, the capital gains tax payments for the initial investment may be deferred indefinitely as long as you roll over the investment into other investments, right? That's why we love 1031s. And we're going to give this one to 1031 exchanges. Yes? Is that April 2026? It's 2026 taxes that you're paying in 2027. You're paying, your, it's, it, your, it's due December 31st, 2026, which you pay April 15th, 2027. So capital gains for the sale of real estate or another investment, such as stock gains or all those other things we talked about, cars, art, etc., can go into an opportunity zone fund. With 1031 exchanges, only real estate can go in. So we're going to give this one to opportunity zones. With an opportunity zone, you can go into a pooled fund like we were talking about. So say you're putting your money in, say you've got you know, $100,000 or a million dollars, whatever you've got from a capital gains going in, and that money can be allocated across multiple assets, which is kind of cool. For 1031, it's not really designed for that. It's very difficult to, to split money into multiple assets. It, it's possible, but it's very expensive, and it's just not a good fit. That one goes to opportunity zones. Both of these, you, if, if you are a passive investor, 
both of these give you the opportunity to be a passive investor. You can be a passive investor as a 1031, or you can be a passive investor on opportunity zones. You can also obviously be active for either one of those. So we're gonna give this, this is a tie. With opportunity zones, if you hold it for at least 10 years, you can pay no federal capital taxes, uh, gain taxes on any appreciation. With 1031s, you won't owe capital gains tax on the final sale of the asset, right? Unless they do not sell, they pass on the property after death. So once you die with, with your properties, the basis gets stepped up, and whoever now inherits it gets deferred, and you don't have to, all those, those taxes, the previous deferred taxes go away. So that one is a tie. I put it more on the 1031 exchange side. That's the way my family rolls. We, we, because I'm passing all, all of my real estate to my children. But somebody might say, no, I want for our household, our investment strategy, we want to take the money out of real estate at some point and not pay the gains. So that's kind of a personal preference. And then lastly, you need to consider your state rules. Okay, we've been talking about federal capital gains, but there's such a thing as state taxes, and California is all about them. So you've got your federal taxes and your capital gains for opportunity zones. California State is not in line with that. They're like, yes, we've got opportunity zones, you're welcome to invest in them, and by the way, when you're paying your capital gains tax, make sure you pay me your one. Okay, so you can look, and that link will take you to see what state is what, and then the 1031 exchanges, it's been around a lot longer, so most of the states have kind of figured it out, and uh, most of them are in line. There's a few of them that are a little weird, where you, uh, only, you can only get away from, the 1031 has to be done in the same state. That's the only way that it's gonna be eligible. And evidently there's some weird thing going on in Pennsylvania. People will have to figure that one out. But again, there's a link there, so you can see what your state is. So we're gonna give this one in the middle, but please make sure you check with your CPAs about how, your, how you will be affected by the capital gains at, from the state level, so you're not surprised. And now, these are just a bunch of Q&A stuff that's going up, and so we're just gonna wrap up, and I'm gonna take any questions you guys have. Say a little bit more about the art and vintage cars I can have on, because I'm just thinking like real estate, and since they're kind of not, up and come up neighborhoods. What does that actually mean? If art. you're selling a car or yeah. you're selling a piece of artwork, that capital gain from those items could be put into an oh, opportunity. Oh, I, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Which is, yeah, with 1031, of course, that wouldn't be, you know, there's no yeah. other. So those are the type of capital gains that people are trying to free up. Got it, right. Like the stock. So you're just yeah. selling those items. You're selling something. That's got a way it. to generate a gain. Now, I often get the question, well, what if I want to put my money that's already been taxed that's sitting in my account and I want to put it in an opportunity zone fund? Well, you're welcome to do that, but you get none of the tax benefits. It's yeah. just a straight up investment. And I will tell you that most opportunity zone investments yield lower returns than a non-opportunity zone investment because the, the fund bakes it in that you're going to get those those returns you're going to get the you know they bake it into the numbers mm -hmm. but they're also potentially investing in um, much more expensive property or you know yeah so it's not like an apples to apples investment where you're it, it tends to be a lower a lower IRR for opportunities are okay. yes so the thing that I kept missing is um, whatever your capital needs and you put in you said substantial and you just named a number 600 is that matching what you put in it's the matching the building the building so so the cost of the building. So say it's a million dollar that you bought, $400,000 was the assessed value of the land, 600,000 was the assessed value of the building. You have to bring in another 600, whatever the value of the building oh, is, the right? So minus the land, they don't care about the land. Now one strategy that people use is to do immediately do a cost segregation study. <coughs> So a cost seg study could allocate a much larger percentage of that million dollars to the land. They could say, no, 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 this is really valuable land around here. It's really, it's all about the land. The building's nothing. <laughs> the building is, you know, there, there's really no value in the building, right? So that would be a good situation in an opportunity zone. So if you look around, most of those are already taken, by the way, where it's a little house that you just need to scrape off. 
So the value of the house is nothing. It's all the land because the improvement is very little. That the, to meet the substantial improvement, it's a very low threshold at that point. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, let's say that you already acquired a property. You already improved it within two or three years. Can you refinance and get capital back to your investors? And yes. You, you still keep your property for 10 years? It, well, there the investors would need to stay in the in the investment for 10 years in order to get their gains. You can you can refinance their money back, yes. right? So they have their capital back, but you would need to keep them in the investment um, mm -hmm. so that they would be eligible to to have that um, their capital gains tax free at the end. But you can give them back their their initial capital. And can they reinvest? Can they, can they reinvest with that capital another opportunity zone? Um, well, yeah, they can take that capital and do whatever they want with it. They okay. can take that, yeah. But if their investment is on just that, what, what you're having to substantially do, that's not classified as that because the initial gain is just part of it. If their money is nothing to gain, then they're just helping you with the building of the substantial growth, and it's just a regular way to get its investment, right? So there's no tax benefits. Well, he was talking about the investors that were already in. Uh, were you saying your investors brought in capital gains or non capital gains? Mm, but yeah, but probably capital gains, yes. Well, probably. It would have to be capital gains for it to be eligible. Let's just be all clear about yeah, it that. Has, it right? has to be, yeah. It has to be capital gains. They have to be able to show I sold this stock on this date, and within 180 days, I took that money and I put it into this opportunity zone eligible asset. Okay. That they, they're ha you have to be able to tie it all up in a in a package. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When when you're creating a syndication or a fund for the acquisition, if there's like a percentage of the money, I mean, can you mix funds from people who doesn't have capital gains with people who, who has capital gain, and what is the rule in that one? So my understanding is there's not a rule that you can only take twenty percent non-capital. There's not a rule. The only rule is that anyone that is not capital gains. If you're trying to write off as much as you can of the building, and you're like, wow, they gave me a lot of building, now I'm going to be able to depreciate a lot of that building, that's great, you know, over time. But in this sense, you want to have much more land um, allocated of that assessment. So the more land you have, the less improvement you have to bring in. Okay, because you have to bring in an in substantially improved according to the assessed value of the structure. Just the structure, and and one way to do that. So the cheapest way to do that is is buy land that has something that's like a shack on it that just needs to be scraped because then the value of that is very very little. Now now there's also um, in case any of you have the opportunity to, to look for this, there's a rule that came out in the new, the second tranche that has to do with abandoned buildings. So if the building has been abandoned, I believe it's for five years then the substantial improvement element is gone. You could just go in and renovate that and, and move from there, okay? So if you, if this is, if this concept is something that it really intrigues you, there'll be a third tranche that's gonna come out. Watch the rules, look for loopholes, you know? Don't, don't let the whole thing scare you away. Team up with people, try and make it work. There, this is a huge opportunity for people. It's an opportunity for communities. It's an opportunity for family wealth. Um, there's a lot of wins that can happen with opportunity zones, but you can see it's not all, um, you know, flower and roses. There's like some thorns, okay? <laughs> there's some thorns in there. Make sure you don't get stuck. We're going to take one more question. You might have hit them all. Wow, women, speechless. <laughs> Ball on my hands because I have her business card, <laughs> which means you have to come and talk to me later to give it to you because I'm, I don't want to just away cards. So um, who learned something today? I love this. Isn't it she amazing?
I don't know if she's ever spoken here before. Yeah. Amazing CPA. They specialize in real estate strategies for mm -hmm. savvy real estate tax strategies for savvy real estate investors. They are my CPA. They were on the show. They wrote the book of, for Bigger Pockets. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay, so her and her husband okay. were on on the oh, webinar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I next week we're doing that. Um, we've got a guy coming for due diligence. Oh, wow. uh, anyway, we, we we have lots of great things happening. All three webinars you can dial in. If you subscribe to it and you're like, ah, that's not a good time. I'm feeding my kids or whatever then um, you'll get the replay. So you can watch it at your, at your leisure. Just sign up for it and then you know watch it later. Perfect. So you just go on and then you can look at all the back stuff. Too. Yeah, yeah, you can look at all the back stuff. There's quite a big library there of stuff, including all the ones I mentioned. And you'll hear my voice a lot on there. Now I show up places and they go, oh my God, I know your voice. <laughs> awesome. awesome, thank you. So I have my business card. Talking about cost segregation, uh, for those who are members, I'm going to be announcing because we have a class coming only for REM members. And again, if you want to know how to become a REM member, just uh, reach to me too. We also have a prefab pre pre event coming on August 21st for members only, where we're going to be talking about uh, the entire concept of prefab. So we get into more uh, details too. And that's part of it. And then, first of all, I want to thank Nicole. <laughs> Nicole has been taking pictures of all of you. <laughs> so, Nicole is one of our sponsors. She takes amazing pictures and for events, for your headshots, for everything that you want. And uh, I always send an email after we have our meetings, uh, two days after, so you have her information. I will be including Anna's information too, in case that we miss each other and and I just want to thank her for being here and spending the time with us and you know you will see some of those pictures in our Facebook page for Rent LA chapter and also sometimes I put it in meetup so you can see yourself and download the pictures and have fun. Um, the other thing is also I want to always um, thank the community leaders Stephanie, Daisy, Shilpa um, and, and Isumi that has been helping us a lot too. Um, and Nika too, to, to make this event happen. And it's important that we, uh, we integrate the entire community. The closer we are, the better we can function and the better things we can do together. So I'm looking for the host, because she wasn't here. <laughs> okay, maybe you can share your thing. I had one more thing. I, I have a, a Harold's booklet on Opportunity Zones. It's like an e-booklet. And basically, you can text to get it. I, I sent out the wrong text yesterday. So if you want to get to connect with it, it's like, a, you know, Wright's written all about it. It's pretty cool. And you can connect with us on OZs. Just text the word five perils, number five perils, to 44222. Five perils, P-E-R-I-L-S. Five perils to 44222. And you'll get, uh, you'll receive an e booklet on. Opportunity zones and the perils. It goes into a lot more detail than I went into, and the and, and learn continue to learn from us about opportunity zones. And again, we're trying to really make sure that investors understand that they're educated about opportunity zones going forward, and they, they know what they're getting into. So five perils to four four two two two. For now, please go and eat the food and ask for the business card. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for watching. It was a long video, but a lot of really good information packed into that presentation. I really hope you enjoyed it. If there's any part of the video that you liked, disliked, or just had a general comment on, please feel free to drop your two cents in the comment section below. Otherwise, if you have any questions about the program, please, please, please direct them directly to your um, tax and financial advisors. Um, really just sharing this information um, for general purposes so that you know it's out there and you know um, and have a general starting off point. But all right. Thanks so much. Bye.